he's very big on longing. You know how he he was so curious the Guermat and the Guermat in his imagination, and then he finds you know how he had blown this thing up and anticipated. Then he finds himself in the Guermat drawing room and he's listening to. Uh, the actual conversation, and he keeps thinking, "Well, I'm in this drawing room, so they're they're not having their their usual magical thing because I'm yeah, here." The worst, because where's because, the great Gramont? Uh, yeah, the, with, you know, where, where's that great Gramont <laughs> with me? Because they they're 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 I'm just here, so they're not bringing it out because yeah. it must be fabulous and fascinating when I'm not around. Yeah, <laughs> and right. you you find out it's just as uh, mundane as uh, anybody else, and that was that was a very interesting, you know, his imac. And we've all had that experience, you know, you imagine you're going to be, you, you know, if you've ever seen somebody famous from afar, and you, and you have some kind of, they look like these mountains of, you know, of, you know a celebrity or, or achievement or something, they look so big, and then you're suddenly in their presence, and, uh, well, they're just people. And yet, on the other hand, when you see their you know, the, sometimes you see their achievement, then they are mountains too. You know, it's it, the, that shifting perspective that he uses was. Uh, and then there are old people, like in this last party. Yes. Which is uh, so dramatic. It's one of the most magical things in literature, I think. Yes. He realizes he's old. Yeah. Yeah. But, but he, he thinks first that everybody has put on a disguise. It's a costume ball. Everybody dresses up old before yeah. he realizes everybody is that old and he is that old too. too. Yes. But uh, the way you describe that the human experience uh, that that is that our young self lives on inside us and we ne never really change from young to old. Uh, and then we see people we haven't seen in a long time and, and they're perfectly old people or middle-aged people. Yeah, and, and who are these people? Yeah. Yeah, and then the discovery, uh, it's a magical... Uh, passage uh, it's, quite, it's, it's just incredible that somebody can put it this way and and uh, communicate something that's known by all but doesn't really uh, get under your skin and grab you quite that way it does with the cruise party it's incredible his um his description of painting I, and, I, and I talking about how El Steer changed uh, vision how you how he'd paint the ocean and now you how an artist by the, his interpretation you'd look out and you'd no longer see the ocean you'd see an el steer mm -hmm. and I, I i thought that his understanding of, of the power of art but that's that's what he does to me too with you know, certain, like, wow. certain aspects in my life i can't see anymore without thinking of proof sure. but it, it it happens to me with painting too as I entered the Prince de Guermont's library, I remembered what beautiful first editions it contained, and I promised myself I would look at them while I was waiting there. And as I continued to pursue my thoughts, I took the precious volumes down one by one, without paying much attention to them, when the moment I opened one of them distractedly, François Le Champy by Georges Sand, I felt an unpleasant shock as if from some impression too much at odds with my present thoughts, until a moment later, when, with an emotion which moved me almost to tears, I recognized how much this impression was in accord with them. At first I had asked myself angrily who this stranger was who had come to hurt me. The stranger was myself, he was the child I was then, whom the book had just revived in me. Because knowing nothing of me but this child, it was this child the book had summoned right away, wishing to be seen only by his eyes, loved only by his heart, and speaking to no one but him. Like, he, like remember how Swan saw Odette as, and I don't remember the painting, that he, 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 he saw Odette as the... Um, the, the girl in the painting mm -hmm. and from then on she became this paint you know th that that 
that was Odette, and the real Odette he kind of canceled out because he was this fantasy of this. She had the face that reminded him of the painting. Yeah, this and, and, and noble woman. That this no, the this noble Odette, right. and, he, and he fell in love with that look because uh -huh. he fell in love with the with the with the painting. Yeah, that's true. What did, what did you think of Swan? I like the description of the old Swan when he's not the the big. Uh, Shaker anymore, you know when yeah, he's, when he's the humble swan, the humbled yeah. swan and yeah. stuff like after the drive was affair and after all that. I found this a very interesting human portrait. But the the swan in all his splendor, uh, I I never thought of him as the how how sad the how character. sad when all you know uh, when. Everyone had forgotten Swan. Yeah, that's that's when he really touches me. You know? Yeah, and and how about that as as like life? You yeah. know, I mean, here was this guy, and and you, he he's sacrificing for his daughter, and he's all worried his daughter will carry on, and his daughter had already jettisoned his name, and uh, no one brought Swan up, and everybody talks Swan, yeah, but thing. nobody, but they gave all his attributes, they spread his attributes out to other people. And uh, rewrote his history. And this last encounter he has with Swan at this party. Uh, there's a party where he encounters the Swan, yeah. who's kind of a broken man. But I like, uh, I like uh, his uh, his uh, part, uh, his invitations to Swan. You know, and uh, when he's he, when Marcel is young and sees Gilbert uh, at Swan, I like that. These scenes a lot. My favorite character was always the Baron. The Baron Charlus. I don't yeah. know if, if everybody feels like that about yeah. him, but he's just the most colorful and the most human. I mean, Baron Charlus is the great character. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, he, he just is. <laughs> and uh, till the end, when he's blind and still tries to finger young boys. Yeah. He's the most exciting incarnation of an aristocrat, I think. You know, there's uh, many things that I don't like about aristocracy, but uh, a character like uh, Chalus who, uh, who draws his power and his, uh, his charisma from this long line of uh, celeb uh, celebrated ancestors and winners of great battles and stuff like that. And the way he does it, and the way he uh, kind of understates it, you know, his, uh, for instance, his name, he could call himself Prince of Naples or something, or Count, Count so-and-so, Guermantes, uh, but he chooses the lower title of Baron Charles, you know, yeah. because that understatement is, is a true sign of aristocracy. But he is yeah. he's the top uh, top man in his family. Yeah, know? but he does have the eye. He does have the but, brains. Yeah. You and, know, and, he, he's a pervert. Yeah. But he, you know, well, I don't. Yeah, he is pervert. But uh, he he is the, the best of the, the Germant by by far. Ariane is hateful. But but yeah. it's it's just always interesting to uh, listen to Chalus and to uh, to observe his antics the way. Uh, Marcel observed them, his obsession with the violinist and how his lock falls into his forehead and stuff at this very moment of yeah. dramatic passage in music. <laughs> it's fantastic. I looked at Monsieur de Charlus. Undoubtedly his magnificent head, though repellent, yet far surpassed that of any of his relatives, you would have called him an Apollo grown old but an olive-hued, bilious juice seemed ready to start from the corners of his evil mouth. As for intellect, one could not deny that his, over a vast compass, had taken in many things which must always remain unknown to his brother Germant. But whatever the fine words with which he coloured all his hatreds, one felt that, even if there was now an offended pride, now a disappointment in love, or a rancour, or sadism, a love of teasing, a fixed obsession, this man was capable of doing murder and of proving by force of logic that he had been right in doing it and was still superior by a hundred cubits in moral stature to his brother, his sister-in-law, or any of the rest. Just as in Velasquez's lances, he went on, the victor advances towards him who is the humbler in rank, as is the duty of every noble nature, since I was everything and you were nothing, it was I who took the first steps towards you. 
You have made an idiotic reply to what it is not for me to describe as an act of greatness. Proust's mind manages to, to put this intimate uh, these intimate thoughts on, on paper without a filter of some preconceived art form or without um, with, without really um, being uh, being inhibited by by any um, school of writing. I mean, he, he started the, the modern novel. Uh, you know, in a in a regular novel, there would be uh, time allotted to the description of the preparation, and then there would be the guest. You know, if this was a chapter, a regular chapter would be uh, maybe five, ten pages of preparation, but then the highlight would be the arriving of the guest, but not so with Proust. It just goes on for a hundred pages with just... But, but it's never boring. It's never boring. And when I saw this, I was just spellbound, you know, I, I, I couldn't believe that somebody could have the freedom of just writing his, his impressions regardless of judgment of... Um, how would the reader take this up uh, and stuff like that? Uh, now, now because it, it limits the readership also, because people are used to getting a certain uh, dramatic um, fix every once fix. in a while. Yeah. Yeah. But else. also this, this idea of being able to make art of everything, I can only compare it to Andy Warhol. Who That's a, a real that interesting. Because yeah. He doesn't say, oh, this would make a good story, you know, now I tell this story or that story. It just starts. Well, Proust, he remembers, uh, you know, Warhol, Warhol, of a dinner. Warhol was Pr uh, Proustian. Warhol was Proustian yeah. in, in, in many ways. Uh, this Polish kid, immigrant, or family of immigrants, uh, pressed his nose pressed against the glass and then making his way, and then making his way up through the, the social world. And uh, once he was on the top of the social world, I, I don't think he was. You know, I, I know I. But you he know, was Proustian in that sense that yeah. he truly admired the high society and truly wanted to be part of it. Yeah. And uh, Proust too, uh, and without uh, without value, or judgment really. Uh huh. Whether it was the driver he talks about or the count himself doesn't make a difference to Proust. And with Andy, it was like that too. Yeah. Any last thoughts? Um, no, but I um, I once read um, from uh, Truman Capote that he said he was asked, oh, "What's your idea of a good time?" And he said, <clears throat> "Taking uh, Proust books to a quiet town in Switzerland and spent a month there <laughs> reading." I, and I can I can see that I am going to do this soon too. Well, I think that's it. Yeah, okay.